I, I don't even remember how to pay Bunko. I think we actually physically paid Bunko twice. Right? <laughs> it, was more, it was more just a, a social opportunity. And for any of you who have families at home going, seriously, you're going to Bunko, I'll be like, isn't that awesome? Look at the networking opportunity. Because I got to know everybody so, so well. And of course, in those, what is everybody talking about? Real estate, absolutely. Then as I'm starting to get business in there and I'm starting to sell them, then I become, you know, not only my social dawn, but I'm also, wow, you're doing stuff in the neighborhood. Tell me about that. So I'm using those social opportunities, those networking opportunities to really talk about my knowledge base so that I become the expert for the neighborhood. Um, another big thing that I do. Yep. So when you guys think of farming, what do you guys think of? Mailers. 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 Right? That's what I'm thinking. When I think of farming, mailing. I identify an area and I'm mailing. Has she really mentioned mailing in how she's working on farming there? Not yet. Now, I'm sure she's doing some mailings, but what I'm hearing is that she's out there focusing on a, you know, not a demographic, but a geographic area, and it's still relationship. It's just targeted to a given area. So I think that's a very key point. It's not just she didn't just identify an area and start mailing, and, I, you know, six months, I've sent out 17 things, I got nothing. She's out there interacting with people. Right. That's kind of the lead, and then I would imagine that the marketing that comes behind it is supplemental. That's like, a, oh, that reminds me, yeah, we had a great time that night or whatever. Supplement as opposed to being I'm, everything. I'm building the relationships first, and then what are you doing I'm first? building the relationships. What are you doing first? Building no. the relationships. <laughs> Why is that important? <laughs> because real estate is a relationship business. Relationships first. You might want to write your own Yeah. So I'm um, building the relationships with them. Um, so what we also started doing, I think it was probably the second year that the neighborhood was in effect, um, was, was built, which was probably, I guess, 2000 and, 2000, uh, probably 2007, beginning of seven. I started sponsoring the neighborhood garage sale. Twice a year, I do a spring and I do a fall garage sale. And now, you guys, people are absolutely addicted to my neighborhood garage sales. Two months before I typically have them, it's the emails, the text messages, the phone calls. When's the sale going to be? When's the sale going to be? Things get busy and I get a little bit late. Seriously, Don, when's the sale going to be? I mean, I cannot not do the sale. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Now, here, let me tell you something really important. Matt talked about she builds the relationships and then I'm sure she follows it up with mailers. Guess what, guys? You know how I let people know when the neighborhood um, garage sale is going to be? I knock on the door. But you're a $30 million producer. You're a big time. You, you actually knock on doors. 185 homes? 185 homes. Yep. Takes me takes me about 8 to 10 hours. because So I, I usually do it over a couple of days because I don't just stick them on the door and run away. No way. Are you kidding me? I'm, I'm offering, uh, I'm, I'm offering um, a value, right? I'm coming from contribution. I'm <coughs> offering a value. So then when I turn around and I'm asking for business, does it seem out of whack? Right. It's natural. I'm helping you. So I'm going to ask for the business back. Let's be real clear. Do you, do you send nothing out in terms of flat or anything at all? Anything? No. I mean, that, that's, that's not a key or secret. I don't know what it is. No flyer, no material. You, you're going around knocking and doing it in such a way that you're, you know, it's not right. like, hey, I've got this door hanging around and I'm going to run, hoping to get a hold of them. You, the, object, you know, the objective is to speak to them and convey the message. That's right. So I'm knocking, that's I'm knocking on the door. Um, I'm knocking on the door of every house, and then when they come to the door, and, and I'm not doing this at a time when I think they're not going to be home. I'm doing this when I think they you are going to be home because I want to talk to them. I want the face to face, and so um, I'm saying, "Hey guys, it's you know it's done." And I'm not really a solicitor because I'm providing a service that they want. So, hey guys, it's here. It's garage sale time. I'm delivering it. Hey, um, let me know if you're going to be able to participate. And you know, are you, do you know of anybody who may be thinking about? buying or selling, or if you guys may be thinking about it, just let me know. So I'm asking for the business after I give them, um, after I give them the flyer about about the neighborhood. Okay. But what does that mean, sponsoring it? What are you doing to extra sponsor? Okay, it? so um, I'm doing all of the uh, marketing, and this is the only time that I use a newspaper, <coughs> is when it comes to garage sale time. So I'm putting it in a couple of different newspapers. We're posting on Craigslist repeatedly right before it comes, putting it on the websites. So getting all the visibility. Um, the Friday night before, um, I have special garage sale signs that I had specifically made up that have the cross team on them. We're putting those in the yards of the houses that have RSVP'd, um, and as well as the directional arrows to the street. We get balloons, and so then the morning of, at 5 in the morning, um, my team comes, and this is, guys, this is definitely a team effort, and I'm going to get into how the team helps with this. The team comes, and we, uh, you know, one of them's putting, putting the signs out Friday night, because guess what? what where, where is the money coming from? 
where is the money coming from? Where is the production coming from, guys, with the team? Is it for me putting up garage sale signs? No. No. Exactly. Me staying in my 20% is what is part of what's helping to grow the team. So what's happening is my support, my amazing team members are saying, Dawn, what can we do to help you? So, you know, Friday afternoon, they're putting up the signs. Saturday morning, 6 o'clock in the morning, they're coming to help put balloons on the signs that we're putting out there. So I make it a team effort. And actually, this, this last year, we were getting a little bit tight on the time frame. Four of us went, and, and everybody knocked on doors. And they were also waiting for the people to come to the door, and they were just identifying themselves as with the Kraus team. So it didn't have to be me doing every door. It used to be me taking eight to 10 hours every day. As time got a little bit tighter, again, I leveraged, right? So I have amazing team members who just identified themselves as a member of the team. They're still giving the same contribution. That's what the people want, you guys. They don't need me to deliver it. They just want the info about the garage sale, and then they ask for the business. <coughs> So, but it was it was members of my team that were doing it. Cool. So we want to make sure we get you out of here on time. Well, one question that we're rolling is next step beyond farming. Okay. Are you asking them at that point for their email address so that you can give them more information, or so they can email you back? Um, I already. That's a great question. I already have their their email information because um, guess what I did? You sold them. A neighborhood directory. <laughs> <laughs> the neighborhood directory got all of their information. Yep. So I, while I'm not mailing to them. I am. I put them on um, on uh, drip campaigns, so they are still getting stuff from me. But guess what? The drip campaigns aren't costing me. The mail campaigns are. Yes, sir. Can you tell me uh, what uh, demographic and what uh, what the homes are? Are they heavily uh, price point? Right. Yeah, so price the, point. the demographics of the neighborhood that I farm right. um, between five hundred and seven hundred thousand. So as you guys can see, I usually sell you know, five, six, at least five, six houses in there a year, whether it's my listing or buyers that I'm bringing in. So, I mean, we're talking anywhere from seventy-five to $100,000 in GCI a year from my farming. So that's a lot of relocation. <coughs> yeah, we get a good amount of relocation. too. How much do you think you invest in terms of marketing and things like that in your farming area to get that return of seventy-five to hundred thousand? <laughs> a few hundred dollars. A few hundred, because it's not about the money I'm spending, it's the time. Let's think about it was why, the relationship. Why, why is she only able to spend a hundred two three hundred dollars and get a hundred thousand dollars in return? That's I'm not excellent at math, but I'm thinking that's that's pretty good. Uh, it's the time you put in, right? Which is really prospecting, right? You're Absolutely. prospecting as opposed to you know relying on I just spent five thousand dollars on a series of mailings and you know, <coughs> you know well, you're, you're I don't wear spending spending money on marketing, I don't wear that as a badge. The lack of money I spend on marketing is what I wear as a badge because I have the results to show and it, it, it's not that I don't market, I just do it in a different way. I just do it um, with the uh, internet. Um, kind of question, a little bit more spiritual towards, um, say you start out in business and you have five to 700 names with phone numbers and email. What would you do off the bat to start that off? Okay, so um, the question was, starting in the business, five to 700 names and emails, what do I do with that information? Right? Database management system, for sure. Whether it's, depending on what, what company you're with, or whether it's Top Producer, eEdge, whatever, whatever database management system you learn and you're most comfortable with, I would absolutely put them into a database management system because what that's gonna do, it's going to systematize your follow-up with these pieces. So it can be um, putting them on a 33 touch, which is like a marketing thing where you're, you're touching them every um, 33 times in a 12 month time period. So, um, because that's about staying top of mind. Um, so it's, it, and a lot of that is done automated, in an automated manner through um, putting them on this 33 touch through the database management system. It's when I start touching base, um, when I knew was asking about, hey, you talk to somebody and then all of a sudden they're doing something else. What happened in between here? Where was I or was I not touching them? So some of it's via, um, via email, some of it's me picking up the phone um, quarterly and, and calling these people. Um, some of it is handwritten notes. So the, the management system tells me what I need to be doing to, touch, to be touching them. Because people say, oh, I follow up on my leaps. I follow up. Right, so I mean, what does that really look like? I mean, so like for the first week, are you remembering to shoot them an email and, and maybe make a phone call? What are you doing for them three weeks down the road? What are you doing for them three months down the road? We are not superheroes, guys. We, we've got to have we've got to have help, and that help comes in the way of systems of the database management system. So let's Great let's uh, let's start out. I'm looking at like a layer cake. First layer is your sphere of influence. People know you know you're positive life. That's low hanging fruit. 
Then you start to generate income, they call it leading with revenue, and now you're taking some of that revenue, a whopping $200, <laughs> 2,000 pennies basically, and you're putting that towards marketing and things like that with your farming area. And then there's another layer that you really focused on and kind of um, taken the next level here recently, and that's the internet, right? Yes. In terms of lead generation on the internet. So what do you do, what are your strategies, what do you have going on that's working well with the internet today? Okay, um, with the internet, um, what we are doing with that is we are doing a lot of um, internet marketing. I don't do any print marketing. There are three mailers a year that I send out. Um, the Cardinals schedules, the Rams schedules, and then the annual calendars. The reason I spend the money on doing those is because they have shelf life. Those are the only mailers that I send out. Get what are the three again? Uh, Cardinals, uh, Cardinals <coughs> schedules, Rams schedules, and the um, annual calendars. They have shelf life. Entire SOI or just your major? No, no. T entire SOI. Which is how big is uh, of the me the people that I, I know well, it's about 800, 800 to a thousand, I think, and then the two hundred or one hundred eighty five in the neighborhood, and then um, we also mail them to some of the people that have we, that we've picked up as leads from the online marketing. Um, so the internet stuff that we're doing. Uh, so I have a business manager. His name is Terry Peterson, and he actually cannot be here today because he is learning how to get even more fabulously smart on blogging. So he's in Orlando, Florida, um, learning training on blogging. Um, oh, but I'll fly from across <laughs> <laughs> so he's out of the mortgage business and he's your... Correct. Awesome. Correct. Mm -hmm. And we're going to talk about how that relationship yeah. came about. He's so a great guy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Peterson. Terry Peterson. So he is, um, he is incredibly talented at doing the marketing. That is not necessarily my niche. Um, but what he does is he, he focuses a lot on social media marketing. So every listing that I take now, guys, um, I actually ask them, do you have a Facebook account? Do you have a Twitter account? Do you have a LinkedIn account? Mm -hmm. And the reason I do that is because um, the team will actually post uh, their listings. We do uh, professional material um, via the uh, internet. Um, and we email them, we can email them the e-flyers that they can then send out to their sphere of influence, to the people that they know and that they work with. You think that's pretty good publicity? Right. That's right. Awesome. Absolutely. Um, we will also that post cost? that cost is nothing. Zero. Nada. Nada. Um, then we also will post uh, their listing to their Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn accounts. That costs again nothing. And now we're not posting my other listings, just their listing. But then of course everybody that they're friends with, all their connections are not only seeing their home, but they're also seeing our branding. Um, <coughs> Diane. Yes. So the, the fan page and then the personal. Right. Correct. Mark. Do you commingle those with a lot of real estate on your personal page? Commingle. <laughs> I, I do about this much on my Facebook good work. <laughs> but I, I no, I don't. I should ask the girls. Right, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um they, they post all of the inner all the real estate stuff just to the to the, the business side of things. Business side. Okay. Yeah. Fan page. We used to do it on my personal and then Terry said, No, 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 no. Don't do that. Right. Uh, Craigslist. We do a lot of Craigslist, um, a lot of Craigslist postings. A lot of Craigslist postings. And just so you guys know that there's the heavier times for the Craigslist um, visibility is uh, 6 to 7 a.m., 2 to 3 p.m., and 6 to um, yeah, 6, 2 to 3 p.m. and 6 to 7 p.m. So rotating so your when you post matters. Right, when you post matters, frequency and when. And what was that again, Don? What was the time for that? Six, uh, six to seven. Six to seven. Two to three and six to seven. So I'm told, this is all the stuff Terry tells me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you guys have a lot of questions in terms of lead generation. We want to make sure we're spending our time and getting get out of here on time. We've got a lot of stuff to cover. So if you guys have other questions and things like that, I'm sure if you email Dawn, she'll be able to help you or talk to her afterwards if you're going to hang around a little bit. Yeah. So we're going to keep the kind of pace moving along. We're going to switch to listings. So let's talk a little about listings. You know, why do you focus on listings or do you? And then let's talk a little bit about, you know, how you go about it. Absolutely. Um, listings are, are huge. Listings are, um, are I can hear you guys following along. That's great. I love that. Can you guys hear me okay? Am I loud enough? <coughs> okay. Um, the listings are, that's the bread and butter. I mean, that, that is listings equal leads. Without listings, you've got to work a heck of a lot harder to get leads to grow your business. Listings are where it's at. I love listings. Well, did you kind of figure that out? I mean, you said earlier you were working with buyers initially. Was there a point in time when it clicked? 
or you know, what was the mindset shift to focus? That, that that actually probably clicked when I was hit when I hit that ceiling and I was going. There is not another minute in this day. I'm not sure how in the world I'm going to grow my business anymore. Ding ding ding. Perhaps if the focus becomes more on listings, that will help, and it did. So the really the, the business really started growing exponentially when I really put more of my focus on the listings. Um, like I said before, you know I can I can work with you know ten list ten sellers, talk with ten sellers in the same amount of time it takes me to put one buyer in the car and show them ten homes. So which is a better use of my time from a gro business growth standpoint? Right, the sellers, right? So. Um, Focusing on the listings, I know I'll get to you in one sec. So focusing on the listings has been a major game changer. Now again, biggest part guys, it's great to have these leads to go take listing appointments. What do you have to be able to do at a listing appointment? Get the listing. Gotta be able to get the listing. How, how is it that you get the listing? What gives them confidence to scripts. be able to want to list with you? Scripts. Your scripts. Your presentation. Scripts, and scripts, guys, all scripts are, are the answers to frequently asked questions. If you really think about the objections that people give you when you're in a listing appointment, I mean, really, the, the source of those, how many really are there? Five, six, seven, eight? I mean, the main things, pricing, uh, commission, um, staging, I mean, it's really the similar objections that you get. So it's about being very scripted, again, having the answers on the tip of your tongue when you're in these listing appointments. And when and, and this is this is how I became very proficient at taking listings, is when I go in there, I'm so used to answering these questions. I got used to some of it by just doing it, some of it doing the, the, the role playing um, with team members, with myself in the mirror, whatever the case may be, so I could kind of see how my body language was coming across. When I say in the mirror, it's not because I'm vain and want to see how I look when I do it. It's about looking at my body language. So I can see if I'm exuding confidence. Because when, when exuding, when you do things very well and you can do it over and over and not have to think about it, that comes across in a very confident manner. And when those sellers perceive that confidence, they're like, oh, man, you know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. That's true. Do you know that 7% of communication are spoken words? 7%. So 93% is body language and other things. 55% so 55, 55 of it is your body language. 38% of it is your intonation. So that's why when I say that, you know, I look at my secret here sometimes and look at how I'm, I'm coming across because that's over 50% of how they're perceiving me. And perception is reality. So what I want to do is I want to walk, I want to walk everyone through kind of your process here. We love the questions. I, I think if we can get through a little bit of it, we'll probably answer some of your questions and then we'll circle back. Does that sound fair? Yeah. Yeah. All right, so let's say um, a lead comes in and you know, you've got a couple types of leads. Ones that are, you know, I'm glad you called, I want to, you know, let's list the house and set the point. And then other ones where I'm assuming you follow up. So let's talk a little about you know, your process for staying in touch with them. And then once you get an appointment, we're going to talk about what you do before and then after the appointment. Okay. So um, when we already talked about the leads, working the leads through the database management system. And then when somebody calls and wants to talk about listing a property, first thing I do is I do a, a pre-interview, um, a pre-listing interview with them. So I, I used to do it, guys, where I'd be like, on the fly, and this and that, and I'd be like, okay, yeah, I'll be there on Tuesday at 3 o'clock, boom. And I get there, and, and I'm, I'm going in cold. I mean, that was just really not a smart way to be doing things. Cold? I don't have any idea what I'm walking into. What's their motivation? Are they re remotely realistic with their price point? Are they upside down on the house? I don't know what I'm walking into. So they're pretty sold on you and your services. Absolutely. Right. right. So, so let's, let's go through that. Um, that Call beforehand. What do you What do you say? Okay, so on the call. You, is it a team member? No, actually, it's me. It's me um, that's doing the phone call. It doesn't take that long to do it, but I'm asking them, how long have you been in the house? Bobby, let's start from the very beginning. You, you know, ring, ring, ring. What's the first thing that you say? Hello. You just say, how long have you been in the house? Oh, so if, if they're calling. <laughs> 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 what's the first thing you say? So they're calling me. Yeah. Well, so if you're if you're calling them and you've got the appointment set. And you're getting prepared. Okay. So you're calling in for that pre listing interview. Gotcha. Let's go from the top of that and kind of walk okay. through it. So the first thing is to say, you know, I'm reconfirming the appointment that we have set up. And then um, what I'm doing is I'm saying, I'm saying, is it okay if I just take a few minutes of your time to ask you a few questions about the house so that Get I can permission. come better prepared? Get permission. Then I'm asking questions like, how long have you been in the house? Have you done any improvements to the home since you've been there? And again, if I'm going kind of fast through this, guys, and you want to get these questions that I asked, just shoot me an email, and I can I can send that to you via email. Um, what improvements have you done to the house? 
do you have any idea what you think the value of, do you have any, even a rough idea of what you think the value of the home is in today's market? Well, no, that's why we're bringing you up. Absolutely. You know what, what this does, though, is it just kind of gives me an idea um, of, of um, price range that you're going to be in. And um, what's, I, I just tell them that it's given me an idea of what sort of, of uh, price range we're in, what kind of marketing we're going to be doing to what target uh, marketing population, that sort of thing. So I give them a reason why I'm asking that. Then I ask, um, do you know what you owe on the house? And sometimes people get a little like, really? And I'm like, hey, you know what? Unfortunately, I know that kind of seems like a personal question. Unfortunately, in today's market, what people have been going through, there are times when what the market will bear for the home is less than what they owe on the property. And if we're going down the road of, of, of that sort of situation, it's kind of a different line of question and a different approach that we take to the process. So if they even ask, which most of them don't, most of them just tell me, um, then I justify why I'm asking those questions. So, and then, oh, another question that I ask is, um, and I don't use these words, the, the, the underlying is, are all the decision makers going to be there? Okay, so I say, okay, so, you know, Jane, is it just you that's gonna be selling the house? Well, no, me and my husband and my husband, Jim. Oh, okay, great, well, is Jim gonna be there? Well, no, he can't be there at that time, but, you know, because he works until five o'clock. You know what, I so respect the time. I understand with your busy work life and your kids and everything like that, I so understand how challenging it is to have the time in your schedule. Out of respect for you and your schedule, what I'd like to do is maybe see if we can pick a time when you and Jim can both be there. Why am I doing that? So you don't have to make a second trip. Don't have to make a second trip. That's right. You got it. So let's think about that. We all have the same 24 hours in a day. You know, some of us, you know, freak out $5 million in buying plus our life. Some freak out at this level and the levels that feel good at all those levels. However, the more you do, the more efficient you have to be with your time. So that's why it's not because you're rude or anything. You're forced to do it because you can double time it, right? Right. So you got to be more efficient with time. That's the reason behind it. Absolutely. Right. Do you ask if they're interviewing other agents? Um, sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. Um, and you know what, if I don't on the phone, I do in person. Do you try to be the last appointment? No, no. A huge percentage of people mm -hmm. only She's interview one. <laughs> only interview one agent. Right. And I'm again, I'm so confident that I can give them the best service of anybody that's out there, why would they need to talk to anybody after they talk to me? You don't want them to make a mistake. Statistically yep. speaking, the sellers list with the first person that they meet with. Now, what does that tell you? Get in there first. Yeah. That's right. Now, Dawn's about to go to a listen presentation and share with your, you know, what she's doing there, so you guys know. But at the end of the day, it's statistical probability. If you make it there first, you will get it. And then, of course, you'll get more as you become more efficient with what you're saying. So let's go to that. You're okay, at the so, house. so we're at the house. Um, so well, the, you, you knock on the door because under these little things, and my, I'm a big believer that in life and in business, little hinges, little hinges swing big doors. So it's the nuances, it's the little things that really separate people from being average to excelling. It's not necessarily, it's the little stuff. So you're at the front door, you knock on the door. I have a three o'clock appointment with them. Knock, knock, knock at three o'clock or a minute or so before. Hey, um, Matt. I'm Don Krause with Keller Williams Realty. We had an appointment at 3 o'clock today. Right it's, three, it's 3 o'clock. Is it okay if we go ahead and, and if, if it's okay if I come on in? So you so we had an appointment at 3 o'clock. It's 3 o'clock. What does she say? I'm on time. I'm on time. Now, this is going to be funny to the people that know me. What, what does she to separate herself from the majority of realtors out there by doing one thing? Being on time. Being on time. <laughs> yeah. There you go. So that's kind of like important. Right. Okay. Um, we start by, um, start by, I do a tour of the house with them. And the reason I'm doing that, guys, is because that's an opportunity to build rapport with them. If I sit down and I just start going, here's what I do. The, the, I want them to get to know me a little bit on a personal basis. I want to get to know them. I want to see what their hot buttons are. And as I walk around their house, I can, by looking at pictures, by looking at their decor, I can get ideas on what, on what their hot points are. Right? I can see that they love baseball. I can see that they have twins. I can find ways to connect with them by because I'm in I'm in the, on their turf. Okay. So then. Um, Question back real quick. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. When you are, are doing the tour of the home, do you ask them to take you through their home or do you walk solo? 
Okay, so I pretty much I pretty much direct it because I want to be moving faster um, mm -hmm. than what they probably do. The only thing that I ask them to do is I say, as we walk around, I'm going to write down the upgrades and the features that I see in the home. If you can share with me additional features or upgrades that you've done to the home since you've been here, and if you remember what year you did them, that's great. So I'm really only asking them to tell me about it, if it's an upgrade they did and when they did it. Um, okay, so then after we go through, after we do the tour of the house, we sit down. And here's a big piece, guys. I don't just sit down and start going into my listing presentation. Because guess what? This appointment is not about me. This appointment is about them. I stopped assuming long ago that they want to hear everything that I think that I want to talk about. So when I sit down, before we get started, I say, hey, you know what, before we get started. <laughs> So um, before we get started, before we get started with the presentation part of things, I just ask, hey, you know what, Mr. Seller, I'm just going to ask you what information is important for you to hear today to make sure that this is a good use of your time. Is it the agreement thing you have, or only? no? When I'm there in front of them. What information is it important for you to hear today to make sure that this is a good use of your time? Tough thing to hear. What is it? Oh, what, what, what's, you know, what's your commission? Great. That is a, <laughs> that is a super, what are the, really guys, what are the two most important things I want to know? Price, price, price and commission. Number. There you go. So um, those are the two most important. So how do you handle that? That's I say, you know what? Okay. That is a great question. We are absolutely going to get to that. What else? She doesn't answer until she's ready. Right. And I'm going to explain to you why I don't answer it until I'm ready. Um, so then they tell me the other things that they want to know, and I go, okay, great, awesome. And oftentimes it's my marketing, right? So even if they don't say my marketing, they say, you know what, if it would be okay with you, I'm going to go ahead and go through my marketing here real quick, and then we're absolutely going to hit it on the other questions you asked, which is the pricing of the home and the commission. Do you guys know why I want to show them the marketing first? Show them your work. Justify your commission. Price only becomes an issue in the absence of value. I have to show the value that I bring to the table before I start talking to them about commission. I have to show them, I, I tell them statistics so that I, I can prove to them, hey, my systems models and the way that I do things works. Therefore, when it comes to pricing, I've set myself, I've set the stage that I'm an expert in what I'm talking about. Because how many of them already know what they should list the house at? <laughs> and they know because they watch what's going on in their neighborhood. <laughs> right? And they watch the news. It, oh, yes. Oh, because I looked at my testament <laughs> said. Ooh, that's my favorite. Right. So those are the kind of those are the kind of questions we're asking. Doing the doing the marketing uh, talking doing my listing presentation. And let me point something out to you guys. In three years, I have never left anything at a seller's house except my business card. I leave nothing. Three years or the whole time? No, three years. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Because when I started becoming more focused on my business and having the mindset of a business owner, I started going, I need to watch my expenses. Seriously, guys, how many of them actually leave, read your booklet that you're leaving them? Seriously, they don't. What about a pre-listing presentation? Do you send them a pre-listing presentation? I intend to start doing that. <laughs> <laughs> Do I? No. Should I? Yes. Thank you for calling me out on that, Deborah. <laughs> So um, I don't leave anything with them. And you guys, I've never had anybody say boo to me about it. Never. <laughs> I do. You just said a few minutes ago you don't do any open houses. How do you handle those kind of objections as they come along? OK, great. Um, the, the way that I handle it, and, and let me tell you, I bring that up at the listing presentation. Because that's a conversation that I want to have in person so I can see their body language. Okay. So I've just talked about my value prop. I just talked about what we do and don't do. Um, and then I ask them, if they don't ask me, I ask them, what are your thoughts on open houses? And they say, well, it's kind of going to let you think about that. Or some of them will say, well, yeah, you know, I'm great with that. And we can do it. And I say, is it okay if I kind of just give you a little bit of my perspective on those? And of course, they always give me permission to do that. And I say, here's the deal with um, open houses. The National Association of Realtors, or NAR, statistics show that less than 1% of the time is in an open house that sells a home. Less than 1% of the time. 
it's typically your neighbors, it's tire kickers, it's people looking for decorating ideas, it's not where your, where your buyers are coming from. Another NAR statistic is that those people who are actually buyers are actually looking 20 to 30 percent outside of their price range. Driving around, see a pretty house, go in and go, oh, we can't afford that. Do you really want, and, and so I say, I'm having more, I'm validating, I'm having more and more of my sellers move away from doing opens because they're getting frustrated at taking all the time to clean their home just to have the neighbors come through to then tell, and, and not active buyers. The other piece of it is, in case you haven't heard, financing is getting a little bit tougher. So really we know we've got statistics showing that it doesn't sell homes, it's not qualified buyers coming through, we know it's harder, and with the team structure that we have set up, and again, use whatever value prop you have, there will never be a time when a qualified seller, if they don't already have an agent, won't be able to set an appointment with me to get in and see your home. So I just count them right from the beginning. So not only you, but your buyer's agent don't build out. Um, when we are looking, when, when we're looking to ramp up the lead generation, David, then we do, um, then we, I will have, the buyer's agents will do open houses, but again, we're controlling that. We're not having sellers going, what are you gonna do my next one? Why aren't you doing this? I discount it from the beginning, and then if down the road we bring it up, very rarely do they say, but wait, you said to not do it. If they do call me back up and I go, you know what, yeah, activity hasn't really been exactly where we wanted, so we thought maybe this could be a surge. And guess what, guess what the greatest way to get the most publicity about that open house is? Reduce your price. price reduction, so we wow. control it. She tied that together. Yeah. <laughs> um, I have given a couple of listings back after I realized maybe perhaps the guy was just looking for a girlfriend versus a real estate agent. <laughs> so if, if I don't feel that, that it's appropriate, um, then yes, I have done that. However, no, I mean, I, I typically am taking them, but I'm setting up price reductions from the beginning. And it, it's very situational. I mean, we can I mean, do it's the thing with it's a property. Yes, and it's got to be it's got to be at the right price, and they've got to be very motivated. Depends on the motivation. Guys, we're going to do probably just a couple more questions on this, so we can kind of keep rolling through. I want to make sure we get to hit everything. Um, that's all I hand over here. Um, John, you said you don't leave any paperwork there. Mm -hmm. um, do you bring paperwork with you to I, I go bring, over the pricing? Great question. Thank you. That is a really good question. I bring two things with me. I bring my iPad, which has my listing presentation on it through Drop. I have it on Dropbox. So I bring my iPad so I'm scrolling through it um, and I'm presenting it that way. And then the other thing I bring with me is yes, I do bring comps with me. Now, this is a great <coughs> question. Um, as far as the pricing is concerned, if I, if obviously I know the address of where I'm going right up front. If it's a property in a neighborhood that I know very, very well, then I will come prepared with a price in mind because I know the competition super, super well. If I don't know the area super, and I mean super, super well, because pricing, I mean, who, who, who can attest to the fact that pricing is like volatile? But absolutely. It's imperative that you're pricing the property right. So I'm shooting myself in the foot if I don't know those comps backwards and forwards to be able to properly advise them. So what I'm doing is, in, in that pre-listing phone call that I'm doing, I, if, I don't, if I know I don't know the neighborhood like the back of my hand, then I'm saying, hey, just so you know, here's my process. When we come, we're going to look at the house. I'm going to show you my listing presentation, and then we're going to, I'm going to tell you in general about what's going on in your neighborhood. But Mr. and Mrs. Seller, until I look at your home, I have no idea what I'm comping it against. So for me to walk into your house with a price already in mind, I'm really doing a disservice to you and to your home. So I set it up from the beginning that I'm not going to come in with a price. Then when I'm there, I'll, the paperwork that I bring with me is um, the neighborhood and then pulled out to a radius search so I can show them um, inventory, absor talk absorption rate, <clears throat> average days on market, those sort of things. And what I'll be doing there is saying, you know guys, look, the average days on market is you know, 180 days in here. And you know, do you have 180, oh my God, I can't do that for three kids, I can't do that, great. So you know how we shorten those? We price the house right, we make sure the house is staged properly, which of course we've already gone over these. So I set, I set the seeds with them to listen to me when I get back to them in a day or two on the pricing, okay? So th that's how I use those stats. So, um, and then, and then um, as, we're going through, as we're going through the stats in the neighborhood and the comps, sometimes, you know, if I have somewhat of an idea, sometimes what I'll do is I go through and I show them each one, talk to them about how it's a comparison, and then I go, 
care about? I mean, after looking at all of this, what do you think you should list the house at? Everybody has an answer for me at that point. Even if they were hesitant on the phone, they all, they're smart, right? And I've just shown them all this stuff, and they'll be like, oh, gosh, well, I thought I was going to list it bad, but after looking at this, because then they, they have ownership in that number. Mm -hmm. And it's not just me, the big bad professional, walking in going, saying a price that's too low and them going, well, my house is way better than that. No. I, I, and I tell them, I say, guys, you know, I know these numbers maybe not what you were looking for. Here's the deal. I don't make the market. I only interpret it and, so, and, and consult you on it. So I let them see what the market is, and then they're much more willing to listen to my number um, in a day or two. I think what, a lot of what she's doing is just common sense. You know, people are trying to get the price out of you over the phone and things like that. Go ahead. Yeah, how can I possibly give you a price for your own? I haven't had a chance to see it, right? I mean, that's common sense, right? It's, oh, that makes sense. So just common sense stuff. Yeah. Like it, so if you wait to give them the prices, do you ask them to sign a listing agreement there when, when you're there at your first appointment? Again, feeling them out, um, depending how well do I know the person, not know the person, is this totally stone cold? Do they have the kind of personality? I mean, if you've got a... If for those of you who are familiar with the DISC of personality assessment, if you've got a high S and C who's wanting the stats, who's wanting the numbers, if I ask them to sign a listing agreement right then and there and don't have all my docs in a row, I will turn them off immediately. Mm -hmm. When I've got a high I who's all about the relationship and the this and that, boy, I'm bonding with them like this and I could tell them whatever and they're like, okay, I'm sorry, I'm working with you. <laughs> so it's about here and matching their personality and getting the commitment that way. Great. Good stuff. Uh, what about objections? Do you, you know, do you, so you, you know, what we talk about, you say, you just go and just listen to, you know, you show up and it, it is signed. Is that not a problem? Nope, not or, always. Or you know, everything you going, you, you have some objections, you, you have to deal with. Absolutely. So, you know, the objection <coughs> handling is a big, big part of it. Um, sometimes I don't even know what those are until I'm sitting there in front of them. There are times, boy, when I leave an, a, a listing appointment and I am whooped because they have just nailed me every which way on <laughs> objections. But the, the thing is, is that because I have I have so much practice at it, I still come across with confidence and can still land the listing. What are the common objections you, you hear, the ones you hear most often, and how you handle um, I think uh, commission is probably the most common um, objection that I hear. Now again, I don't hear it as much anymore because I've learned that I need to show my value prep before I even start talking commission. I will still have people who will, who will um, throw out there, well I hear, oh, here's another good one when we're talking commission. Sellers want to feel, how do sellers want to feel when they're going through this process? Is this their home, it's their money, how do they want to feel? In charge. In charge, absolutely. So what I do when they start talking the commission question, I've already shown my value prop, I say, you know what, let's talk commission. If they don't ask it, I bring it up. In fact, I oftentimes try to bring it up when we get to that point, because I know it's hot topic, <coughs> why avoid it? Um, and again, I, wanted, I want to have a conversation in front of them so I can read their body language. So I say, you know what, that's a great question. We typically list between six and seven percent, and I actually let my sellers choose the number. And I kind of go, what? Like that just doesn't make a lick of sense to them. I go, I know, it seems a little weird. Let me tell you why. So there's pros and cons. Of course, by listing at the seven percent, it's one percent less that you take away from the sale price of the home. Now, keep in mind, um, and I've already talked to them about the breakdown of the commission and, and the seller pays and yada yada. So keep in mind that a buyer is going to do the same amount of work no matter what home they sell somebody. So if we can incentivize the buyer by having a larger payout, they're gonna do the same amount of work. So if we can incentivize them to want to push our home over another, then it can help in the sale of the property. Now, Mr. or Mrs. Seller, because don't take them for being stupid, because then they'll get offended. Mr. or Mrs. Seller, I'm not telling you, I'm not gonna blow smoke at you and tell you that you list at 7% and this is the end all be all, you'll sell like this for full price. It's just one more thing in your arsenal going for you, okay? And what we know statistically is that the faster that we procure a contract on your home, the higher list price to sale price ratio that we have. So in all actuality, while the 7% may be 1% less that you're taking home, statistically, we're, we're actually making, we're netting you more than that on the back end. So when you do that, what's your split with the so then, cooperating agent? 45%, uh, 45% okay. of it. So I say, so we can list at six, six and a half, seven percent. I'll tell you, I'm not going to do anything different than what I've already promised you that I'm going to do. This is about you having the option and seeing if you want to add that extra incentive. Then they feel like they're in control of making that decision. And I've, I've made my floor six percent. Mm -hmm. And I've given the reasons to go six and a half or seven. Very good. Well, I had this other agent that came in that said that they would do it at five percent. Mm. 
Absolutely. You know what? There are definitely agents out there who, who will discount their commission. And oftentimes what we find is when they discount their commission, they're also discounting the services that they're providing. If you guys, you know, I've already shown you all the stuff that we do. This stuff is incredibly expensive. And if we didn't do that, you wouldn't even be inviting me to sit at your table right now. So, you, you know, you, you have me here because of all of these things that we do. It's incredibly expensive to do that stuff. And so that's why we don't go below the 6%. Again, I could never get away with that if I haven't already shown them my value prop and the stats that we have to support it. Sure. What is your most um, expensive part of listing a house? The most expensive part? Um, in, in, say, the seller's eyes. Uh, well, I hire a professional photographer to shoot all of my listings, so that's an expense. Um, your team. Expense to you? The expense, what they. I, I talk to them a lot about the breakdown of my team because they don't think, well, if you're just on the internet, it doesn't cost you anything. Yeah, that's if, my opinion. Right. What, what I explain to them is um, the team, the structure that we have is there's a lot of people that my pie pays. <coughs> okay? My pie is split up a lot because of all the team members that we have. And um, do they care about that? They don't really care about that. What they care about are the results. So the most expensive part is paying my team, so I have to justify why it's to their benefit for me to have this team structure. Can you try and get them to sign a listing agreement with you if they say they want to interview other agents? I, if I feel that there's that there's an opportunity right. to close them, then I will say, um, you know, I, uh, I will talk to them about, about doing that, and if they say, well, you know, if I can tell we've connected, we've got that relationship going, pretty sure I'm gonna land the listing, but they feel like they've gotta do that, I'll say, you know what, um, you know, when do you feel like you're going to be making the decision to listen with me um, so that we can move forward with this? And they'll say, um, well, you know, I've got, you know, I've already set the appointment up for these other two agents. I go, you know what, I totally get that, and I am more than happy to call those agents and let them know, <laughs> and let them know that we've listed the property and we would love for them to bring a buyer. You laugh at me, I kid no, you not, good. I've done it. I have absolutely done it. And they're like, really, you would do that? Yeah, out of respect for their time, they don't want to waste three minutes. They already know they're going to list with me. They don't want to waste three more hours, and I don't want those people to have the opportunity to get in and and, and try to win them back over. But what about the scenario where they haven't, they're not convinced yet that they're going to list with you, and they want to interview other agents? Okay, then I will talk to them and say, um, I understand that you're going to be listing other agents. When you talk with them, anything that they go over that perhaps we didn't go over or any objections that maybe we didn't talk about, I would really appreciate if we have an opportunity to talk about that before you make your final decision. And then I ask for time frames. When do you feel you're going to make the decision? And then I say, I don't wait for them to follow up with me. Okay, great. So would it be okay, so it would be okay with you then if I follow up with you on by Thursday afternoon? Don't wait or they could give the business to somebody else. <laughs> I have a problem with value, like putting my value to the page, you know, to going into listings and saying what my value is. Uh -huh. And I just, you know, how do you break it? You don't, don't have a team. So what is your value? What, Great how question. How do you portray all your value? <coughs> Great question. Sorry, I'm saying too long. No, the proper amount. Yes. Right. <laughs> okay, so great question. Use what you have, right? So I have a team. I have statistics. I use that. If one doesn't have those numbers, um, if somebody is looking to nail a listing and doesn't have listings to be able to sell that as their value prop, <coughs> instead of using I, use we, and use your office statistics. Use your, you know, use whatever statistics will help support the message that you're conveying. You know, my office is, you know, here's a great statistic. So, you know, so the, the Chesterfield office that I'm out of, um, we actually just had our office meeting and the, the numbers, the statistics straight out of the MLS were reported to us that Keller Williams Realty Chesterfield has the highest list price to sale price ratio that we are getting for our sellers of any real estate office in the MLS. Now, seriously, are you telling, is that not an amazing statistic for these sellers? So whether you're the one, whether you have listings or not, your office, so we, have the highest list price to sale price ratio for our sellers of any office in the MLS. Now, when it comes to, to uh, when it comes to commission time, and we're going between six and seven percent, and I've just proven to them, and the the, the MLS statistic is eighty nine point one percent, and our office is ninety two point three percent. So that's three point two percent difference. Two hundred thousand dollar listing. I, my office is on average getting three point two percent more. That's what six grand. And, I've, and I'm only asking them for 1% more for the commission? You invest an extra two to 
to make, make six, four. to make four. Yeah. All right. So let's keep moving along. We've talked a little about team and dancing around. We'll segue a little bit. So, so when you great job in sharing information, yes. you've got a listing in hand. Mm -hmm. You go back, and then what happens from there? You, you, are you launching all the marketing yourself, or what's the, what's the uh, process from when you take a little bit of You have a team. How do you handle this real quick? How do you explain to them that you're not going to be doing everything? You know, how do you transition to the team? Okay. So I transition to the team by talking right up front about, um, you know, we believe, and again, guys, I'm, I'm using, don't anybody take this personally, I'm using what I have, right? So the way that we do this is we say, hey, we believe in, um, rather than jack of all trades, we believe in the specializations in the different parts of the real estate transaction. My role in the team is the, um, is the uh, working with the sellers, the agent networking, and the contract negotiations. Sherry, my listing specialist, specializes in the contract to close and all the details that come with that. Amanda specializes in assisting with the paperwork and getting everything gone through. So I basically explain what each team member does. And I explain, again, what do they really care about? What are they hearing? Blah, blah, blah. How is this going to help me? Right? Okay. So what it does is it, it keeps each of us focused at, at doing things at the very highest level on the different parts of the real estate transaction. So I'm giving validity to the different members of the team that they're going to be exposed to by talking about how it's going to be beneficial to them. Okay? So instead of, so instead of um, one person doing it all, we've got a team of specialists. And because they do the same activities over and over again, they become experts in that. So of course that's going to be better for you. Now, if you're an individual agent and can't use that, Listen, I'm an individual agent. Now, you might interview some other teams, but here's the thing. They're busy. They've got a ton of stuff going on. You, you never know who you're going to be talking to. Oh. You're going to have me all the time. I'll be there morning, or night. I will work for you until so you work with what you have, right? That's right. You're going to work with Jeff. So let's go into the team aspect of things. Uh, we, we, I think we left a gap in terms of your production. You did $18 million in a given year, and then you went back. Right. One year to 16.1. Yes. So when. When was it? Okay. So um, 2008, I did 18 million. <coughs> 2009, um, I did 16.6 million. And then it was 2010, we did 21. And what happened there, guys, is I had gotten into some bad habits. I think I already, I, I, have, I have made my deficiencies glaring. So I got into some bad habits, and I had to go back and undo some of the things that I shouldn't be doing. So I had to basically tap, take a small step backwards in order to reorganize how he's doing things and make a huge step forward. <coughs> so let's talk about that. Team, what does your team look like today? Okay, my team looks like today. I have, um, so I'm the Rainmaker specializing in the listings. I have Terry Peterson, who is my um, business manager, and he specializes in the internet marketing, um, and he also does the accountability for the buyer's agents. I have um, Sherry Wolf is my listing specialist. She does all of the contract to close, and she also helps with some of the seller satisfier feedback, that sort of thing. Amanda is my assistant that, God bless her, helps me with whatever I dump on her plate that day, um, as well as getting the listings up and running in the MLS, um, writing verbiage, the marketing printing out the marketing pieces that we have, developing some of the materials, that sort of thing. And then I have um, a virtual assistant um, that um, works with us with postings, and then I have three buyer's agents. There are eight of us total. Mm -hmm. So go over one more time. Huh? Rainmaker, specializing the listings. Business manager, the marketing, and the accountability for the buyer's agents. Listing specialist, Assistant, three buyer's agents, virtual assistant. And before you hired Terry, you did what he did. I did, yes. Before I hired Terry, I was doing more of the marketing. And, and it was really more of a void, really. It was, right. And the stuff that he's doing is more specialized. Right. Just, I don't think it was getting done. But like handling right. your buyer's agents and everything, that was all. That, like that was all me. Gotcha. Right. That was all me. I think there's only so many hours in the day, guys. Time is the great equalizer. We all only have 24 hours in the day. It's how you choose to use that time that separates you from the path. So just real quickly, here's the thing. A real estate agent, on average, 182 different things we do every day in real estate. So as an individual agent, we're the butcher, baker, candlestick maker. We're doing it all. However, because time is a great equalizer, as we go on, all activities in real estate are not, they don't, they're, they're unequal outcome, right? So as Dawn gets more and more business, she's outsourcing, if you will, not outsourcing, but leveraging out to team members for less productive activities. And as of today, the main things you're doing, you're seeing rainmaking. Essentially, you're lead generating at the highest level, and your machine's working to get you appointments, and then you're converting appointments, 
and then you come back and hand that to your team, and then they service it. Right. That's, is that basically what you're doing? Absolutely. And what's your name? You're looking for talent. Absolutely. Looking for talent, um, and we're going to talk about we're going to talk about in just a minute how I how I have been blessed to get into business with the fantastic team that I have. I want to talk about now. We can talk about that after you make the point. Thank you. <laughs> yes, that's going to be when we talk about building the team. But here's something I know some people are going to have to start leaving, and this is a really <laughs> crucial point, you guys, that I wanted to make sure that I talked about. Okay, the balance when. <clears throat> We are running so fast paced. We are go, 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 go. I mean, who feels like you're, feels like really is working from the time you wake up to the time you go to bed? How many of you feel like I live in a world of chaos? Oh my gosh, I am whooped. Okay. <sighs> what is this? Oh, it's a nightmare. Cell phone. A nightmare. As a real agent, I like to call this the most critical appendage that we have, right? This is the most critical appendage that we have. Our cell phone is with us everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. How many of you accidentally have left your phone at home, left and gone, oh my God, I don't have my phone, mm -hmm. I'm starting to shake. And how many of you are going, how could you forget? That's like forgetting to breathe. Who does that, <laughs> right? Our phone is crucial to our business. So from the time we get up, yep, on the phone, on the phone, on the phone. What's happening to your phone by one o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock in the afternoon? Battery's dead. Battery's dead. Battery's dead. Battery's dead. So what do we have to do to it? Charge, Charge it, absolutely. So what do we do? We have a phone charger in our office, we have a phone charger in our car, we probably have one in our bag, just in case we end up somewhere where a phone 